I want to take you back to the year 2010. It's my senior year of high school, and I'm in the final round of a speech team tournament. Yes, I was the nerd in high school who did speech team and considered it a sport. <laughs> there are five of the finalists in the room, 30 people there to watch us, and three judges sitting in the front row with their pens and evaluation forms ready to go. And I'm there to give an eight-minute speech on racial diversity. So I delivered my speech, listened to my competitors do the same, gave them a cute little applause and a fake smile, <laughs> and then we all headed to the auditorium to hear the final results. And in first place, they announce Shawan Jackson. <laughs> of course I share that story because I want you to know how fabulous I am. <laughs> but really, I share that story because it was a moment of pride back then. But when I look back on that moment today, I'm not met with pride. I actually feel regret. What I didn't mention at the beginning of my talk is that that speech wasn't advocating for racial diversity. I essentially argued against it. To be fair, I didn't say that diversity itself is bad. I just didn't understand the merits of racial diversity in particular, in large part because I didn't understand the full extent of racial inequity. Reflecting on this moment, I realized that while I had strong communication skills back then, I lacked critical consciousness, a term coined by Paulo Freire, a Brazilian philosopher, that speaks to one's ability to critically examine the world and do something to change it. Realizing this inspired me to help other youth, especially underserved youth, build not just their communication skills, but also their critical consciousness with the hope that they'll be able to speak persuasively about social justice. But in doing this work, I've realized that critical consciousness isn't just about challenging what you say. It's also about challenging how you present yourself and your ideas. Now, when I first started teaching public speaking, I did not realize this. I used to teach my students the control framework. and went a little something like this. Control your body. Stand up straight, relax your shoulders, make sure they're in line with your feet. Gesture, but not too much. Control your voice. Speak up. Pace yourself. Pause so that people really listen. OK, not that long. And enunciate every single word as you speak. Now, research shows that if you do those behaviors, you actually do sound more persuasive. But the more I've been working with youth of color, and the more I've been reflecting on my own public speaking style, I realize that there's a point when control becomes conformity, when the right way to speak becomes the white way to do it. Now, let me be clear, I don't dislike the way that white people speak. I love y'all. <laughs> but it saddens me that we have this unstated expectation that to be heard, you have to make yourself palatable to white majority culture. Maybe that means cutting out the black vernacular you learned at home because it's not professional. Or maybe that means limiting your expressions because you were told you need to tone it down. Or maybe it's cutting your afro, like I did in the eighth grade, because you learned that it's not presentable. These behaviors reflect a concept called respectability politics. When marginalized people present themselves in ways that are pleasing or respectable to those with more privilege. On the one hand, this makes complete sense. Our world favors those who just fit in. And as important as authenticity is, it comes with a risk of being judged, of being ignored, of being silenced. And this is a risk that many people care about, not just people of color. According to a 2014 inclusion report from Deloitte, 83% of lesbian, gay, and bisexual people in the US said they are not fully themselves at work. 66% of women said the same and so did 44% of straight white men. Many of us feel this pressure to conform, to avoid the risk of exclusion. But conformity comes with a cost. Every time we change how we present, from the words we use to our tone to our presentation, we validate a status quo that does not equally appreciate multiple forms of presentation. We send a message to younger generations that you can be heard so long as you sound, look, and dress more or less like everyone else. The easy answer would be, well, don't conform when you communicate. But it's not that straightforward. Because at times, you do need to accommodate your audience so that you can make your perspective heard. 
I don't know the answer to, to this question of how to deal with that. On the one hand, I do want to be authentic. On the other hand, I want to be heard. Even as I'm standing in front of you right now, I'm wondering if the way I'm dressed and the way I'm presenting is really me or just what I think you want me to be. And if I can't answer that question for myself, who am I to talk to my students about it? One of my mentors said, you don't need to have the perfect answer, Shawan. Just open up the conversation with your students so they can critically engage with the topic. So now in one of my classes on public speaking, I read a series of statements and ask students, go to one side if you agree, another side if you disagree, and somewhere in the middle if you're conflicted. Agree or disagree. If I were giving a speech in front of politicians, I would change my hair so that I look more professional. Students spread out across the entire room and began to debate their opinions. One of my Latina students said, I'm not going to straighten my curly hair because that's a part of who I am. Another student respectfully disagrees and says, it's not that big of a deal to me, so I'm going to do it. We don't come to a perfect answer in that activity, but that's not the goal. The goal is simply to question when persuasion can be problematic. In that same activity, I read another statement. Agree or disagree. To make people care about a social issue, I would share a sad story about myself. This leads to a critical conversation about storytelling. Too often, we, we share those sad stories so that people feel bad for us. And while those stories can be moving, they can often fall into this trap of poverty porn. You know what that is. Those TV ads about those poor little kids in Africa who needs your donation. That story about the boy named Tony who grew up in Chicago in a rundown apartment in a single parent home who would not make it in life unless you donate to his nonprofit. That's poverty porn. Storytelling is a powerful tool of persuasion. But the problem with poverty porn is that it reduces your humanities to the struggles you've endured. Without critically examining the narratives we're putting forward, we risk diluting our self-worth, presenting an incomplete picture of who we really are. And that's a problem. When I was teaching public speaking last summer, I had a student who I won't soon forget, Jose. He's a junior now, Dominican American, incredibly smart, and he dished about half of my classes. <laughs> so one day, I'm in the hallway with him, and I take him to the side, just to say, what's going on? He told me he didn't like public speaking, I figured just about as much, but his reason why is what really got to me. It doesn't matter how much we speak up, he said. At the end of the day, rich white people will always be in power. Deep down, I fear that Jose is right. Not because rich white people will literally always be in power, but because if we're not mindful of how we're presenting, how we're advocating for change, we risk changing the people in power, but leaving the culture largely the same. So if I were talking to younger Shawan today, I would tell him two things. One, you're going to have that baby face for the next 10 years at least. I'm sorry. <laughs> it is what it is. And two, and more importantly, I would say that it's not enough to change your topic for that speech team competition to argue for racial diversity instead of against it. You also need to critically question how you're presenting yourself in that room. Are you making yourself conforming too much? How far are you willing to go? And I want Shawan to think about those questions as a teenager because 10 years later, I want him to feel free and comfortable to speak his own truth, the entire truth. Not just because it would make me feel better, but because when you speak your truth, your whole truth, you empower everyone else around you to do the same. Thank you. Thank you.